Good afternoon. The first item of business is up. Point of order, Stephen Kerr. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. On a point of order, um, members will be aware of the news that broke this morning, as announced by Ineos and PetroChina, that they intend to close the oil refinery at Grangemouth by the spring of 2025. Members will also be aware that this would end Scotland's capability to refine petrol and diesel at scale and will increase our reliance on facilities south of the border or indeed abroad. And let's not forget that Grangemouth plant, the Grangemouth plant makes up 4% of the entire Scottish GDP. So thousands of jobs are reliant upon the plant and the entire supply M of Mr. petrol, Kerr, could diesel. you please get to the bit that engages the standing orders of the I, 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 am, I am coming to that very oh. point, Deputy Presiding Officer, because this is a very important issue. Uh, Mr Kerr, please resume your seat for a second. Please resume your seat for a second. I appreciate how important the issue is. What I'm trying to do is to ensure that the standing orders of this Parliament are respected. A point of order must trigger a standing order of the Parliament and therefore I would implore the member to please indicate which standing order the member is making the point of order further to. Thank you. To that point, because thousands of people's jobs are reliant on the plant. I'm giving context. Mr Kerr, please resume your seat for a second. With all due respect, I understand very well the context. I'm asking if the member could please indicate specifically what his point of order is. Thank you. Understanding about points of order, Deputy Presiding Officer, is that you have a number of minutes to explain what it is that you're seeking guidance on. And because but, Mr Kerr, could you please indicate what you're seeking guidance on? Thank you. I'm, se I'm seeking guidance on the fact that we need a ministerial statement on this matter. And I am asking the presiding I'm asking you as the presiding officer, and I'm, I'm somewhat surprised about how this statement, how my point of order is being dealt with, if I may say so, because... Mr because Kerr, please resume your seat for a second. I, I will not really take any implicit or other criticism of the chair. I understand the, the member seems to be seeking a ministerial statement. I, I'm quite happy now to address that request. Thank you. So the member, will, the member will know, if I could perhaps finish first, if I could finish my comment, the member will appreciate very well the various ways in which matters can be raised in this parliament. Um, on the issue of a ministerial statement, uh, I would imagine that the member would perhaps wish to discuss that matter with his party business manager so that the party business manager can seek to raise the matter in the bureau. Thank you. Further point of order, Mr Kerr. And it's all right for you all to sigh, but there are um, Mr. Kerr, thousands of address, jobs. Mr Kerr, please address the point of order you I, now I, wish to make. I, I, have I been allowed to make the point of order that I was giving? I would... It was a point of order. And can I remind the members that there Mr. are Kerr, thousands please, of Mr. people Kerr, whose jobs are on Mr. the line? Mr Kerr, please resume your seat for a and second. I, Mr Kerr, please resume your seat for a second. Mr Kerr, I have asked you a number of times to indicate specifically, Mr Kerr has indicated that he's seeking a ministerial statement. I have indicated to Mr Kerr how that can be pursued. Mr Kerr wishes to raise a further point of order. I'm happy to hear Mr Kerr's further point of order, but I would wish to be assured that it actually is a point of order that engages the standing orders of the Parliament. Thank you, Mr Kerr. My simple point, Deputy Presiding Officer, is that my understanding of the standing orders is I have a couple of minutes to explain the context for the point of order I'm raising. You allowed me very little time to give this important point of order. And I repeat, despite all of the muttering from the SNP benches, this is a very important matter for my constituents, thousands of whom, the jobs are on the line, their livelihoods, the whole economy of this area. And yet I'm Granted a few seconds to make a point of order. Mr Kerr, you've already, it's now 14.04.37. Uh, Mr Kerr, what is the next point tried. of order? What is the next specific matter pertaining to the standing orders of this parliament that the member, by pursuit of a point of like order, to... wishes to invoke? My point of order is as, as, as I've expressed it. But I'm making the point that under the standing orders of this parliament, 
a member is entitled to two or three minutes to well, explain the, Mr. Stand, Kerr, I to explain the point of order, and I wasn't already, allowed that privilege. We are already at 14.05. Uh, oh we are at 14.05, oh so I think there's been a, a good... I think there has been a good exploration of the issues that the member wished to raise. And the member's point about seeking a ministerial statement has been noted, I'm sure, by everybody in the chamber. But, of course, the way in which the member can best pursue that, and I really would not appreciate the member continuing... Mr Kerr, please desist, desist from challenging the authority of the chair of this parliament. Please have the courtesy to do that. And as I was saying, as I was saying to Mr Kerr, who continues from a sedentary position to challenge the authority of the chair, and also is being extremely rude in my view, I would say that the member well knows how a matter can be pursued, and that is through his party's business manager, and I suggest that he may wish now to have that conversation. So I would like, like to now move to our portfolio questions, and the first portfolio is Wellbeing, Economy, Fair Work and Energy, and at question number one, I call Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting businesses in rural areas to become accredited living wage employers. Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. In the absence of legislative powers to mandate a living wage, which are reserved to Westminster, we fund the Living Wage Scotland team at the Poverty Alliance to deliver living wage employer accreditations and promote the benefits of a real living wage to businesses, rural and urban across Scotland. As a result of this effort, Scotland now has over 3,400 living wage accredited employers situated across all 32 local authority areas, covering a range of industries and sectors. Scotland leads the UK with 91% of employees earning at least the real living wage and proportionately five times more accredited employers than the rest of the UK. Emma Harper. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Rural and small businesses that I regularly visit across to Fries and Galloway and the Scottish borders report that they would like to become accredited living wage employers, but that often due to the nature of rural employment practices, such as seasonal working and often small and changing workforces, and the costs associated with becoming accredited, it can be difficult for small and medium-sized rural businesses. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any further information about the steps that can be taken such as through enterprise agencies to help support rural businesses to deliver fair work practices such as a real living wage and a remind chamber I am also a living wage employer. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, President Officer, and I thank uh, Emma Harper, not just for her question, but for her work uh, in this area. We appreciate uh, the challenges many employers have faced due to the pandemic, uh, Brexit, the rising cost of doing business, and that some sectors and regions, particularly in rural areas, continue to face difficulties. The Scottish Government's Fair Work Action Plan commits to supporting employers to utilise the resources available to embed fair work in their organisations. We have made Fair Work First guidance available and have developed a Fair Work Employer Support tool uh, with our enterprise and skills agencies and in uh, Emma Harper's case I'd like to pay tribute to the work of uh, the South of Scotland Enterprise and their partners uh, in encouraging the uptake of the real living wage in that area and we will continue to work with partners to uh, join up provision of advice and support for employers through a central fair work resource making it as simple and efficient as possible to use. Uh, supplementary Mercedes Villalba. Does the Scottish Government know how many of Scotland's 1,125 rural estates are accredited living wage employers? And will the Cabinet Secretary join me in calling on any estates who are not yet accredited to register today? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I think anyone that uh, has uh, the ability to take that choice, to move to being a real living wage employer, will see the benefits in lower attrition rates and greater productivity uh, amongst uh, their business. Uh, and of course, uh, regardless of the sector, uh, I would uh, encourage uh, employers across Scotland to take up becoming a real living wage employer. And supplementary, Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Scottish Government outline any assessment it's made of the growing number of businesses who are accredited living wage employers and the impact on the horticultural sector and future of the Scottish Agricultural Wages Board? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, this is an area that's under active consideration across government and, and across different uh, portfolios, obviously recognising the fact that there are uh, in challenges uh, across uh, different el elements of the economy, the agricultural sector uh, being one. We're looking to do all that we can to provide support to employers, regardless of sector, uh, to ensure uh, that the benefits of being a real living wage em employer uh, can be utilised. But at the same time, we're understanding of uh, some of the challenges that there are in those areas, and I'd be happy to discuss that further with Beatrice. Sure. Question number two, not lodged. Question number three, Paul O'Kane. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address the reportedly stagnant level of economic growth. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. The cost of living crisis continues to impact households and businesses' ability to spend, which in turn affects the wider economy. Despite these extremely challenging economic conditions, the Scottish economy uh, remains resilient. Our national strategy for economic transformation contains bold and ambitious actions which will deliver fairer, greener prosperity for Scotland, making our economy more sustainable and resilient in the longer term. Similarly, our New Deal for Business is about creating an environment that supports a wellbeing economy, maximises opportunities of the green economy and helps businesses to thrive. So while we remain tied to a failed UK economic model and do not hold all the financial leave needed, we continue to all use all the powers that we do have to grow a fair, green and growing wellbeing economy, which meets the needs and aspirations of the people of Scotland. Paul O'Kane. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. He spoke about resilience. The news from Grangemouth this morning is deeply, deeply concerning and a huge blow to those communities, not just the thousands of jobs at the site, but those in the supply chain as well. We know that there are significant issues in Scotland in terms of stagnant growth, with um, less well-off areas growing uh, more slowly that, than better-off areas. And this will have a significant impact not only on the regional economy, but also on our national economy. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, when the government was made aware of this announcement by uh, Petro Ineos, what discussions have they had? And crucially, what action are they taking and are going to take in terms of protecting and safeguarding Regarding jobs, moving to that just transition and keeping this Parliament informed. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'll, I'll, of course, uh, endeavour to ensure I uh, keep Parliament informed uh, of updates with discussions with Petra Ineos uh, going forward. Obviously, this is uh, a, a decision that has been taken uh, as a commercial one uh, by the company. We were informed uh, last night uh, that they intended to take this decision. There wasn't a timescale upon it. We were given reassurances uh, that um, they had fully consulted the workforce first before going public. Uh, and as uh, Mr O'Kane would expect, uh, I'm endeavouring to have further conversations with uh, Petri and us in short order in order to understand uh, how uh, this is going to operate. Uh, the uh, assurances we've been given is that the changes that they're looking to make at the site are about ensuring a sustainable future for industrial work at the Grangemouth site uh, and ensuring that there is a long-term future both for jobs and investment in that area. And that is something that, as he would expect, uh, I am uh, incredibly exercised about ensuring can take place. But I'll continue to not only liaise with Petrionios, but also the UK Government, who have a locus here uh, as well, and update Parliament as, in due course. Thank you. I've received a request from four members uh, and given issues that could be raised here, I would intend to seek to take all four, but I would hope that I could have brief questions and answers. And supplementary, Colin Beattie. There is no denying the economic impact of Brexit. However, as the ever-increasing damage of leaving the European Union continues to mount, it seems that Labour and the Tories are keeping their heads in the sand. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any update regarding the latest assessment the Scottish Government has made of the impacts of Brexit on economic growth? And will he join me in calling on opposition members to wake up to the reality of these impacts and to join us in standing up for Scotland's place in Europe? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I can, and I appreciate that question from uh, Colin Beattie. Brexit has caused economic devastation to Scotland and the UK. The UK's inflation rate in October 2023 is still higher uh, than in France and Germany. And in a recent survey of small and medium-sized businesses in the UK, most respondents said that the Brexit had affected them negatively. In March, the OBR repeated their expectation that the UK's GDP will be 4% lower in the long run due to Brexit. And it is clear that the costs of Brexit outweigh any costs of UK membership. So joining uh, the European Union is, uh, as an independent nation, offers Scotland a chance to regain what has been lost because of Brexit. Supplementary, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With 4% of Scotland's GDP dependent upon the Grangemouth refinery, does the Minister not see that this government's rhetoric 
towards the oil and gas sector, matched by the rhetoric from Keir Starmer's Labour Party towards the oil and gas sector, is not helping in terms of supporting what is an essential part of the Scottish economy on which hundreds of jobs will depend. This is, a, this is a commercial decision that has been taken uh, by Petra Ineos. The site is obviously of a particular age uh, that causes a challenge uh, in itself in terms of what is required for the future. Uh, my understanding of conversations that have been had and the conversations that I've had with Petra Ineos is that the decision that they are taking is about ensuring that there is a long-term future for that site, which includes uh, ensuring that they're moving to more sustainable uh, operations. Uh, as I have said in response to Mr O'Kane, uh, I will be looking to engage in further discussions with Petra and Eos. We'll make sure that not only Mr Fraser but the remainder of this Parliament is updated uh, on those discussions, not just with Petra and Eos, but also the UK Government who have locus in this as well. Supplementary, Billy Rennie. I mean, what's the point of having an economy secretary if he doesn't know what's happening to one of the major employers in this country more than 24 hours in advance of a decision. Surely he should be integrated into this company, understanding what's going on. If a just transition means anything, we should have had a plan ages ago. Has he got a just transition for this plant? What's he going to do about it? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, work has been ongoing over uh, a long period of time in order to engage with uh, Petrioneos and the Grangemouth site around ensuring that there is a sustainable future for it in exactly the ways that Mr Rennie uh, describes, ensuring that there can be a sustainable future to provide jobs, ensure that there is continued uh, industrial capacity there at Grangemouth, continue to uh, engage with Petrioneos and the UK Government has locus in this uh, and update Parliament in due course. A supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise the Chamber which economic levers currently reserved to Westminster would help to boost economic growth the most if devolved to this Parliament? And which of those, if any, the Labour and Conservative parties have committed to devolving and it would help save Grangemouth? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. I appreciate that from uh, Kenny Gibson. This uh, Government has consistently argued for the devolution of migration powers to the Scottish Parliament, which would help us attracting working age uh, people and their families, ensuring uh, that our businesses can access skills and people and meet the needs of those parts of Scotland most at risk of depopulation. The UK Government has blatantly, uh, has blatantly ignored those calls uh, on more than one occasion, despite the fact that the UK's immigration system is not designed to meet the needs uh, of Scotland and is having a damaging effect on our economy and communities, especially in rural areas. We also continue to call on the UK Government to devolve employment uh, powers to this Parliament so we can introduce the real living wage uh, and boost the rights of millions of workers across Scotland. I hope the Labour Party support those calls, but with the full powers of an independent country would, of course, do much more. Question number four, Dr Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assurances it has received that the Scottish National Investment Bank is supporting its ambition to create a well-being economy in light of there not being an advisory board in place. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. I thank Douglas Lumsden for that question. Now that the bank is fully established uh, with a growing portfolio of investments, work is underway to establish the advisory group. We receive assurances on the bank's support for a well-being economy by the fact that the missions set by ministers for the bank align closely with our well-being economy principles. Uh, the bank's robust investment processes ensuring investments align to at least one mission uh, and the work of the bank to measure the benefits of their investments published in the bank's impact report. Uh, myself and senior officials also have regular meetings with the bank's senior leadership team. Thank you, President. Cabinet Secretary, the bank has been in operation for three years now, and recently there has been serious allegations made against the Scottish National Investment Bank, one being that the bank lent £7.5 million to a company run by the brother of a bank employee, a company that was loss-making and whose accounts were overdue. It was also reported that there was political pressure in investing £9 million in Circularity Scotland, most of which has now been lost. Now, President Officer, I don't know if these accusations are true, but I do know if the advisory board was in place, as is required in law, then we would have the assurance that things were in order. So does the Cabinet Secretary accept that it is vital that the advisory board is in place as soon as possible? 
Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, we are looking to establish that. As I said uh, in my first answer to Mr Lumsden, uh, we, uh, in addition to uh, bringing about the advisory group, uh, as I also set out in my answer, have regular meetings uh, with the senior management. I re most recently met with the, board, with the, the chair and chief executive uh, on the 2nd of November. My officials re meet uh, regularly to ensure that we have that uh, oversight, uh, and the advisory group will be set up uh, as soon as possible now that it's fully operational. And supplementary, uh, Ash Regan. Thank you, presiding officer. In light of the recent reports that the Scottish National um, Investment Bank investments are being made into firms that are linked to personnel at the bank, what work is the Scottish Government undertaking to improve transparency at the bank, avoid these type of conflicts of interest and meet the high standards that are expected of a public entity? Cabinet Secretary. I thank uh, Ms Regan for uh, that question. As I set out to Mr Lumsden, uh, in the first answer that I gave. We uh, receive assurances on the bank's support for a wellbeing economy and on their work uh, f uh, that it's uh, linked to uh, at least one of the missions uh, by uh, having regular meetings with them, both, uh, both at official and ministerial level. They also have to publish the bank's impact report uh, as well, and all of the uh, the investments that are made are done so in a transparent way for people to see uh, clearly. And supplementary, Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the failure of the recent UK Government auction for offshore wind subsidy contracts to attract any new projects has left investors with reduced confidence in UK renewables, according to the recent EY Renewable Energy Attractiveness Report, with the UK dropping down their international rankings. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on any strategic investment through the Scottish National Investment Bank that will accelerate Scotland's offshore renewables capabilities and help secure a just transition for our energy sector and a fairer and greener Scotland for everyone? Mr Lumsden, were you wishing to make any point of order? Uh, yes. Yes. Sir. Um, on a point of order, can I ask, in terms of supplementary questions, has there not got to be um, some relevance to the initial question that's been asked? Because the initial question was on an advisory board for Scottish National Investment Bank, and the supplementary question seems to have no relevance to that whatsoever. Um, th I thank Mr Lumsden for his point of order. What I would say is, and I listened carefully to the uh, supplementary from Mr Stewart, is that he did uh, sufficiently bring the issue back to, and part of Mr Lumsden's own initial question, what assurances it has received from the Scottish National Investment Bank that it is supporting its ambition to create a wellbeing economy. And that was the bit that I understood Mr Stewart was getting at. And perhaps that is the part of Mr Stewart's question that the Cabinet Secretary could focus his reply on. I appreciate that uh, direction, uh, presiding officer, and you and Mr Stewart will appreciate that I, I cannot give uh, details on active investments that the bank is currently working on. However, the Scottish National Investment Bank has a strong record of investments uh, contributing to the offshore renewable sector, including a £6.6 .6 million investment in clean energy pioneer Verlum, uh, whose technology uses intelligent energy management to deliver constant output of power from renewable sources, supporting the company's expansion plans. In addition, a £50 million investment in North Star Renewables by the bank is supporting the building of service operations vessels to assist the renewable uh, energy sector, strengthening Scotland's position as a, U a global uh, leader in the offshore wind supply chain. And finally, the bank will also make a be a key delivery partner in the recent £500 million commitment to Scotland and its supply chain. Question number five, Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the commitment set out in the programme for Government 23-24, whether it will provide more details on how it plans to increase the number of people earning the real living wage. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. In line with uh, our programme for Government commitment to boost wages, uh, we are providing grant funding to the Poverty Alliance to deliver living wage and living hours accreditation schemes across Scotland, which promote the business benefits of pay security, both for workers and their employers. In July, we introduced a requirement on public sector grant recipients to pay at least the real living wage to all employees and provide appropriate channels for effective voice. While minimum wage rates are reserved to the UK Government, uh, we will continue to use the levers that are at our disposal to promote payment of the real wage, living wage and enhance uh, fair work in Scotland. Marie McNair. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. An effective real living wage policy is a very welcome attack on poverty pay and more must be done to assist those on low pay. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me and the STC 
that the full devolution of employment powers would allow Scotland to do so much more, like ending zero-hour contracts and fire rehire practices. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. And I thank Marie McNair for the question. The STUC and the Scottish Government have long shared the view that employment power should be devolved to Holyrood. We continue to call uh, for this to enable for us uh, to create fairer workplaces, enhance workers' rights in Scotland, help shift the curve on poverty and deliver a fairer, greener and growing economy in a more prosperous Scotland. The full devolution of employment powers will allow us to legislate to support workers in precarious employment, ban uh, fire and rehire practices, and it is important that Scotland can legislate appropriate, appropriately for its own workforce to ensure adequate protections and the security of employment and to fully implement policies that will best meet Scotland's distinct needs. Question number six, not large. Question number seven, Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of its Fair Work First policy, what its response is to report that workers in Scotland lost nearly £1.9 million in wages in a year due to working unpaid overtime. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, President Officer. Far be it for me to, to correct Mr Whitfield, but I think he meant billion as opposed to million. Uh, so we believe that workers uh, should have good work and secure conditions with a fair wage for a fair day's work. We have uh, called on the UK Government to devolve employment powers to the Scottish Parliament. However, while employment law remains a reserve matter, we will continue to use our fair work policy to promote fairer work practices across the labour market in Scotland. Uh, through our fair work policy, we ask employers to pay at least the real living wage and they consider the number and frequency of uh, work hours uh, which are critical in tackling in work poverty. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful for that response and assistance. One of the, well, <laughs> one of the workforces that of course the Scottish Government through its emanations is responsible, responsible for is of course the public sector. So what does the Government have to say to the estimated £15 million of unpaid overtime hours coming from that sector including teachers who are working well above their 35-hour week. So what is the Scottish Government doing to ensure those workers are paid for their work during this cost of living crisis? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I feel I must uh, declare an interest in this uh, case, being the husband of a hard-working teacher uh, and also the son of a recently retired hard-working teacher. Um, obviously, we look to ensure that in our uh, public sector pay settlements, we do everything we can to make sure uh, that our hard-working public service workers uh, are earning a fair uh, pay uh, and doing all we can to ensure uh, that included in those contracts are also uh, an assurance uh, that they they are working uh, the hours that are uh, being ascribed to them. Obviously, there are uh, always challenges to that. We all uh, look to do what we can to make sure that we're contributing in our workplace, but uh, that should be recognised in, in, in the fair work uh, policies that we brought, bring forward and the contracts and the payments that people receive. And brief supplementary, Gordon MacDonald. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that if Scottish Labour members are serious about protecting the rights of workers and going further to deliver fair work conditions in Scotland, then they need to take some proper action to press their London bosses to commit to devolving employment law to Holyrood as a priority. And perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could focus on the matters that uh, could be within his purview. And, uh, thank you. In terms of me being able to, uh, as the Economy Secretary and Fair Work Secretary, being able to ensure uh, that our commitments are being uh, work through uh, uh, in policy terms, it would be most helpful if Labour were uh, able to give that such uh, a commitment and were to, uh, I think, stand shoulder to shoulder with our Scottish colleagues because I think uh, we are in a very similar place. I, I think it's uh, the divergence that there is between here and London uh, that is the challenge and perhaps the further conversations can be had around if there is to be a future Labour government, whether or not they would allow us to have employment law to deliver on our commitments. Question number eight, Martin Fraser. Uh, thank you again, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what policy changes it has implemented as a result of issues raised in the New Deal for Business Group report on progress and recommendations. Cabinet Secretary. I thank Murdo Fraser for his questions. It gives me the opportunity to set out that we have extended the deadline for lodging non-domestic rates proposals from the 31st of August this year, giving businesses an extra month to submit their 23 uh, revaluation proposals following the introduction of the new uh, two-stage appeal system on the 1st of April. It re-established the regulatory review group, which met for the first time on the 26th of October. Uh, 
uh, and will provide an advice on the pragmatic implementation of regulations moving forward. We've started uh, activities to review and update the Business and Regulatory Impact Assessment Toolkit uh, and guidance, ensuring it's accessible and purposeful. Uh, and we are establishing the new Small Business Unit to work more closely with small businesses and ensure that their voices are heard during policy engagement. In such short order, I think that is a good start and there's more to come. Martin Fraser. The uh, Cabinet Secretary for his response, and I welcome all the engagement that he referred to, which is very necessary because a poll done uh, last week of business directors in Scotland showed that less than a quarter believe the Scottish Government understands the business environment in Scotland. More than two thirds disagree with that statement. And what business wants is action and delivery, not just words. So we've just heard from the Chancellor that the 75% rates relief for businesses in the retail, hospitality and leisure sector will be extended for a further year. That is the number one ask of this government from businesses in those sectors, so will they follow suit? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, obviously, this is uh, part of the, on the final point that uh, Mr. Fraser raises on non domestic rates. All of this is uh, in the mix as we assess the impact on Scotland's budget from uh, what we have just heard from the autumn statement. As it takes some time for the implications of what has been set out to come through in the wash, uh, and uh, some of the more positive elements maybe turn out to be more negative in terms of Scotland's budget. Uh, so, what we will uh, do is, is look carefully at what the implication of the autumn statement is on our ability to look at non-domestic rates. Uh, and on uh, Mr Fraser's previous question uh, on uh, the attitudes of, of directors and the feeling, uh, the sentiment uh, of the Scottish Government, that is something that we continue to work on. It's the whole reason why we have the New Deal for Business, why we are engaging in the way we are. And we understand that delivery is going to be critically important, which is why we published an implementation plan uh, earlier uh, this year to go alongside the recommendations of the New Deal for Business growth so we can be held accountable to the work that we have committed to doing. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes uh, portfolio questions on uh, wellbeing, economy, fair work and energy. Uh, we will next turn to the uh, finance and parliamentary business portfolio, allowing front bench teams to change position, should they wish. Thank you. So, uh, again, if anybody member wishes to ask a supplementary question during the Finance and Parliamentary Business Portfolio questions, they should press the Request to Speak button during the relevant question or enter the letters RTS in the chat function during the relevant question. And at question number one, I call Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Pre Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to propose a parliamentary debate on waiting times for elective care for both outpatient and inpatient appointments. Minister George Adam. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank Mr Mount for the question. Currently, there are no plans at this time, and as Mr Mountain is aware, any proposals for government, uh, business and parliament are agreed by the Scottish Cabinet, subject to consideration by the Parliamentary Bureau and in turn approval by Parliament. Edward Mountain. As the Minister will know, and I thank him for that response, this party business is limited to nine debates per parliamentary year. So there's very stiff competition. So will the Minister to undertake to raise this specific issue with the Cabinet Secretary for Health? As despite the National Treatment Centre opening earlier this year, waiting times are increasing in the Highlands and constituents in the Highlands expect these matters to be debated in the Parliament. Minister. Thank you, President Officer, and thank Mr Mount for that question. This is the third time today, President Officer, I've been asked a question out with my uh, portfolio. I take that as a compliment of my ministerial abilities. Uh, but uh, if, uh, the, I would encourage the member to continue. I would, uh, I, I would I encourage the member to continue uh, to, uh, to engaging with health colleagues, and uh, I am quite happy to pass on his concerns to my health colleagues as well. Question number two, Kenneth Gibson. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what impact UK Government annual financial settlements have on its ability to undertake long-term financial planning. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. The UK Government's financial settlements to Scotland significantly curtails the Scottish Government's ability to undertake long-term planning. In recent years, there has been a significant alteration to assumed UK Government's plans as a result of events such as the disastrous mini-budget a little over a year ago. In addition, we must also factor in potential changes to assume capital programme spending 
pending by the UK Government in year to hold against the possibility of negative consequentials that would reduce our spending power in year. This autumn statement simply does not go far enough in delivering the funding that we need. This makes the challenges on our budget even more severe. And in order to bring as much clarity as we can within our gift, we published the medium-term financial strategy, which, of course, sets out the challenges to be addressed in our financial position. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer. Virtually every organisation the Scottish Government funds seeks three to five year financial settlements. Yet we have seen chronic financial instability at UK level, with four chancellors of the Exchequer in four months last year, for example. Has the Cabinet Secretary been given any indication that the current Chancellor is considering longer term settlements in order to help deliver the certainty, efficiency, and effectiveness longer term financial planning would bring? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we've had uh, no uh, such uh, clarity or certainty about longer term financial planning from uh, the UK Government. We continue to face significant funding pressures in the year ahead at a time where costs continue to rise and the need to support people through these challenging times uh, remain. Uh, prior to the autumn statement, I wrote to the Chancellor urging him to provide a funding settlement that enables us to invest in public services, vital infrastructure and fair public sector pay increases. We have seen no such thing from the autumn statement today. And what is emerging is a set of choices that will have a devastating impact on our public services next year. Supplementary, John Smiley. Presenting officer, I wonder, given the answer that the Deputy First Minister has just given to Mr Gibson, whether the government will give consideration to making further representations to the UK government about the necessity of longer term financial planning information so that we are able, as a parliament, to provide greater funding assurance to third sector organisations who are interested in providing transformational change within our society, but need a greater certainty about the funding horizon to enable them to do so. Cabinet Secretary. I can say to John Swinney, we will continue to do so. And having met with a, a range of organisations over the last few weeks, uh, for many organisations, particularly third sector organisations, that funding certainty is almost more important than the quantum uh, of the settlement because it's about being able to keep staff and being able to plan. I have to say, though, what is emerging from the autumn statement today will make every single part of our public sector, our third sector organisations funding extremely difficult indeed. And I will be keen to set out to Parliament at the earliest opportunity the full, the full impact and uh, how grave the situation is after what the Chancellor announced today. Question number three, co Stewart. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on any plans it has to provide financial support for the High Street rejuvenation. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank you. The Refresh Town Centre Action Plan published last year is a call to action both locally and nationally to support the rejuvenation of our town centres and reaffirms our commitment to the town centre first principle. In 2021, we established the Place-Based Investment Programme, which we deliver in partnership with local government to accelerate ambitions for town centres, um, place 20-minute neighbourhoods and community-led regeneration. And this year, we have invested £70 million to support projects across the country through this programme. Co -Cab Stewart. I thank the Minister for that answer. City centre economies are facing significant challenges and Glasgow is no different. Currently, a 5.7 million investment in redeveloping Socky Hall Street, Buchanan Street and Argyll Street is underway thanks to the city region deal funding. However, there has been a recent decline in the number of hospitality businesses operating in Glasgow. What additional investment is being considered by the Scottish Government, similar to the announcement of funding for Aberdeen's Union Street, that will help to boost the hospitality sector and nighttime economy in Glasgow town. Minister. Thank the member for her, her uh, supplementary question. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the challenges that some in the hospitality sector are facing, and as such, we've established an industry leadership group with tourism and hospitality sector to understand its unique needs going forward. 
Glasgow City Council has benefited from a range of investments. For example, in addition to the investments made through the city deal, the council has already received a direct allocation of over £9 million from the place-based investment programme, uh, which council has discretion on how it uses. And we continue to work closely with, Gla with Glasgow, um, holding quarterly leadership meetings with the Scottish Cities Alliance. Last week, the First Minister, myself and Mr Gray, um, met with all eight city leaders as an opportunity to further reinforce our aims to encourage investment and strengthen the prosperity and well-being of our cities. Uh, supplementary, Daniel Johnson. Uh, I remind the Chamber of my register of interest. Uh, town centres act as important and vital commercial hubs, as places for businesses to locate and provision of employment. So while we must rebalance, rejuvenate town centres, does the Minister agree with me that commercial purpose must remain at the heart of town centres? Minister. I, I think the mem member is absolutely right, but I, I do think that um, across the piece, um, we're all looking at how town centres can have a, a, a new vision for the future with potentially more people residing in those town centres to increase the footfall, make sure that they remain vibrant, but absolutely um, commercial um, um, uh, a basis for our town centres is, is crucial going forward. And uh, that's at the heart of the town centre action plan. And supplementary, Peter Swishart. Thank you, presiding officer. A survey from Scotland's town partnership this summer showed that people want to shop locally for ease uh, and also for the planet. But many retail properties in smaller towns and villages have poor insulation and high energy costs. So what more can be done to support the rejuvenation of high streets in small towns and villages uh, to enable more people to shop locally? Minister. I think obviously a lot of those small properties that the member is um, talking about already benefit from substantial support by the, from the Scottish Government, but I think we do need to, to look at what more we can all do um, working in, in partnership, the Scottish Government and our, our local government colleagues, to, to make sure that our um, town centres remain vibrant and um, uh, sustainable going forward. Footfall is absolutely crucial to that, but the points that the member makes around sustainability, particularly given the um, Incredible increases in energy costs are, I think, a really important factor to be considered. Question number four, Sanchez Gohani. To ask the Scottish Government from which part of its budget the additional £300 million pledge for the National Health Service will be allocated. Cabinet Secretary. The First Minister's announcement of new funding of £300 million in October aims to help reduce inpatient and day case waiting lists by an estimated 100,000 patients over three years. This investment is subject to the outcome of the Scottish budget process for 24-25 and future years and associated approval by the Scottish Parliament. I have to say it is deeply disappointing that the Chancellor has failed to provide the funding that devolved governments need in the autumn statement. This makes the challenges for our budget next year even more severe, including for the NHS. Sanders Gohani. Uh, I declare my interest as a practising NHS GP. Well, that, that's not an answer. That's just a, a, a rehashing of a statement. So I ask again, where is this money going to be allocated from? And is it not right that you will be having substantial cuts to places like mental health, where you have already cut £30 million this year? I, I would remind all members we well, do need to speak through the chair. Captain. So let's talk about substantial cuts, presiding officer. In the Treasury documents published today, shows no noticeable investment in public services, including the NHS, resulting in minimal consequential for, consequentials for Scotland's NHS. Less than £11 million in 2024-25 for the NHS, compared to £367 million in last year's autumn statement. These are the choices of Sandesh Gulhani's government that will mean devastating consequences for every part of our public services here in Scotland. And he should hang his head in shame for coming to this chamber asking us about funding for the NHS when his Chancellor has deprioritised funding for the NHS for all to see. I'll take no lectures from the Tories today of all days on funding for our NHS. Supplementary, Carmelkin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm today that all capital spending plans with regards to the financing of its programme of national treatment centres will be delivered by the end of this Parliament as committed in its NHS recovery plan? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, what we will do is, uh, uh, throughout the, the budget process, and when I come to set out the budget on the 19th of December, I have said that alongside that we will set out the revisions in the infrastructure investment plan that will need to be made. If you look at the capital cuts that have been announced and confirmed today, for a, a 7% reduction in our capital spending availability due to the cuts that are coming from the UK government. There is absolutely hardly anything for capital that has been announced by the Chancellor today. So that cannot have no impact on our capital spending and our infrastructure investment. So we will have some very challenging decisions to make when we bring forward the choices that we are making and the priorities that we will take forward. And I will set that out alongside the budget on the 19th of December. Uh, and then supplementary, Willie Rennie. If the Cabinet Secretary will have seen that NHS Fife has already built up a 10.9 million deficit in just the first few months of the financial year, and the chair of the NHS board there is pessimistic about whether costs can be recovered without damaging frontline services. So what is the Cabinet Secretary going to do to stop the cuts to frontline services that could result from this? Cabinet Secretary. We have always, as a government, tried to prioritise funding in the NHS. I'm not going to deny or dismiss the pressures that have come on our NHS with trying to deal with the COVID backlog, trying to deal with uh, pay pressures, the cost of medicines. All of that does keep pressure on our NHS boards. But surely today of all days, Willie Rennie would join with me in condemning the Chancellor and the UK Government for giving £11 million of consequentials for the NHS next year. £11 million, that's all, for the NHS next year, compared to £367 million for the NHS announced in last year's autumn statement. That shows a hollowing out of funding for the NHS, for NHS England and the consequences for NHS Scotland. I don't know why Willie Rennie is shaking his head. These are the facts. I have, I have the figures C from Cabinet the Secretary, Treasury Cabinet Secretary, I'll need to move today. on to the next Surely question. Surely he should join with us in condemning the Chancellor and stand I call with question us number five, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is ensuring that local government finance support schemes are operating effectively. Minister Tom Arthur. Local authorities are accountable to their local communities and have the financial freedom to operate independently, taking account of local needs. The Scottish Government will continue to work in partnership with COSLA to agree a more detailed programme of work, including a fiscal framework and an outcomes and accountability framework to underpin the Verity House Agreement in the coming months. We have also committed to inviting the Accounts Commission and Audit Scotland to be part of this work. Clear Adamson. Yeah, thank the Minister for his answers. We have been helping a number of my constituents who, um, regarding the dual housing support scheme to support people going into rehab and also the discretionary housing payment to mitigate the Tories' bedroom tax. Both excellent examples of this government putting um, cash into the hands of the most vulnerable at the most difficult of times, in marked contrast to austerity from Westminster. But it has become apparent that many constituents, many third sector organisations are not aware of these support schemes administered by the local authority. Can I urge the Scottish Government to work with local authorities to ensure that these initiatives are promoted locally and passported to those who are entitled for this vital support? Minister. Can I thank Claire Adams for her supplementary and for highlighting that Scottish Government investment. We have commissioned Healthcare Improvement Scotland to establish regional improvement hubs that will bring together groups of ADPs and other key parts of the local system to design and improve pathways into, through and from rehab. Part of this work is to ensure that local pathways promote routes into residential rehabilitation, such as the Dual Housing Support Fund. Local authorities are responsible for promoting the DHP scheme within their areas. The Scottish Government has been working with third sector partners to raise awareness of the support available to households, particularly with the newly established Fuller Benefit Cap mitigation. Question number six, Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what engagement it has had with the UK Government regarding any impact of the autumn statement on Scotland's public finances. Cabinet Secretary. 
As I outlined to Parliament yesterday, I wrote to the Chancellor ahead of the autumn statement setting out the Scottish Government's priorities for action. I also spoke to the new Chief Secretary to the Treasury this morning and again emphasised the need for investment in public services, net zero, and to support people with the cost of living. The Welsh Finance Minister and I previously discussed the need for additional investment in devolved government budgets with the previous Chief Secretary to the Treasury at the last meeting of the Finance Interministerial Standing Committee. It's very disappointing that the Chancellor has today failed to provide the funding that devolved governments need, and this increases the challenges for our budget next year. Uh, Bill Kidd. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that. Now, as we were hearing earlier, hospitality businesses have suffered particularly throughout the pandemic, facing rising costs due to inflation and increased energy prices. Can the Minister outline any discussions that have taken place specifically to ensure support for the hospitality sector? Cabinet Secretary. So, my ministerial colleagues and I regularly meet with representatives of the hospitality industry. Uh, the Minister for Community Wealth and Public Finance chairs the New Deal for Business Non Domestic Rates subgroup, which includes representatives of the hospitality industry. We responded to businesses' biggest ask on non domestic rates and froze the poundage in 2023 24, ensuring the lowest non domestic rates poundage in the UK for the fifth year in a row. A rates package uh, is estimated to be worth £749 million and ensures that around half of properties in the retail, hospitality and leisure sectors in Scotland will pay no rates due to the most generous small business bonus scheme relief in the UK. Going forward, we will set out our decisions around non-domestic rates in the budget that will be set out on the 19th of December. And supplementary, Kate Forbes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. According to the OBR, the outlook for the UK is pretty subdued and inflation as well as interest rates will be higher for longer. Much has been made already of the impact of Tory decisions and consequential funding that Scotland will receive. But does she accept that it's a double whammy? Because not only will we be receiving less, but our costs will remain higher because of Tory incompetence. Uh, I think Kate Forbes' summation is absolutely uh, on the button and uh, that is absolutely, she describes it as a, a double whammy. The question uh, for us going forward is uh, how do we uh, reconcile a reduction uh, in our budget, a real terms cut in capital. In fact, uh, next year the, the CDL for capital is uh, a total of £10 million for next year's uh, capital uh, allocation uh, from the UK government in terms of additional capital. I think that puts in context some of the questions that we were hearing earlier on about infrastructure investment priorities. So I look forward to hearing what the Tories' priorities are in the face of the Chancellor's decisions today. And when each and every one of them comes here asking for more money, I will be reminding them of the Chancellor's priorities today, the Chancellor's priorities today, that will have an impact on every Members. single one of their constituencies Thank and you, the Cabinet services Secretary. within it. I call question number seven, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it's made of any impact that its council tax fees policy will have on households in the Midlothian North and Musselburgh constituency. Minister Tom Arthur. The total funding for local government and the significant associated savings for taxpayers for 2024-25 will form part of the detail of the implementation of the council tax freeze, which will be agreed with COSLA over the coming weeks. This will mean that every Scottish household will continue to benefit from cheaper council tax bills. Where council tax, for example, in England increased by 3% next year, it would see the average Band D property in England pay over £700 more on average than a Band D property in Scotland following our freeze. Colin Beattie. It's very welcome that the SNP Scottish Government is helping households across Scotland save hundreds of pounds with a council tax freeze, putting money in people's pockets when they need it most. Meanwhile, East Lothian's Labour Council leader apparently recently threatened to raise council tax by 32 per cent. This would hammer hard-pressed families across my constituency, right in the midst of a cost-of-living crisis. Will the Minister join me in calling on the Labour Party to condemn these tax hike plans and admit whether the Labour Party has been planning similar council tax rises across Scotland? Minister. Well, can I thank Mr Abiti for the supplementary. We are absolutely con committed to constructive engagement with our partners in local government to deliver a council tax freeze. 
which will benefit every part of Scotland. It is for other parties to set out their position. I do admit I, I struggle to keep up with other parties' positions as it seems to change on a weekly basis. But we are absolutely committed to working with our local government partners to deliver a council tax freeze that will benefit every single household in Scotland. Supplementary Pam Gozo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Member is right to question how council tax freeze will affect households in Mid Lothian, North and Musselburgh. But isn't it the case that this will also affect households across Scotland, including my region, West of Scotland, when it comes to delivery of public services? Can the Minister confirm the expected cost of the council tax freeze? And can, more crucially, where will the money come from? Yeah. Minister. As I set out in my um, earlier responses to Mr Beattie, we are committed to that constructive engagement with COSLA to deliver a fully funded council tax freeze that will benefit households in the members' constituency and indeed in households across Scotland. And supplementary, Alec Riley. Thank you, President Officer. Does, does the Minister recognise that after a lot of local services, they're buckling under the financial pressure and without getting into the party politics of this, is the Minister intending to sit down with local government and look seriously at what can be done to protect some of those services that are for the most vulnerable people in our communities? Minister. Well, can I thank Mr Rowley for his question and the tone of the question. We are committed not only to, um, through partnership and agreement with local government to delivering a fully funded council tax freeze, but through our wider commitments in the Verity House Agreement to ensure that we can provide services for all people in Scotland and to ensure that these public services are sustainable and deliver the person-centred services that we all want to see. And question number eight, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its plans to issue government bonds. Cabinet Secretary. The First Minister announced on the 17th of October, subject to market testing and due diligence, that the Scottish Government will go directly to the bond market for the first time in our own right. The issue of bonds is part of a wide-ranging package of recommendations from an investor panel of senior figures from investment finance. The Scottish Government will issue bonds when the value for money case supports it from a fiscal and economic perspective. It's deeply disappointing that the Chancellor has failed to provide the funding that devolved governments need in the autumn statement, and this makes the challenges for our budget next year even more severe. So it's right that the Scottish Government pursues all of its fiscal and economic levers to boost investment in Scotland, including the issuance of bonds. The next steps will be set out at the 24-25 Scottish Budget on the 19th of December. Alistair Allen. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. The bonds clearly represent an important opportunity to use the powers we have to invest in infrastructure uh, at a time of what uh, today uh, is very clearly going to be continued Westminster austerity. So can she say any more about how the bonds themselves may help to raise Scotland's profile and engagement with international investors? Cabinet Secretary. So the investor panel provided its first stage work to the Scottish Government in September and it covers a, a wide range of findings and recommendations relating to how Scotland can attract mobile capital to support the just transition to net zero. It includes a recommendation that although it will it potentially involve uh, additional costs, Scotland's profile could be significantly raised in the international capital markets by using existing devolved powers to issue debt. This will provide a motivation for regular engagement by investors and an opportunity to market Scotland's investment story. It would also allow the development of relationships with providers of debt, a track record and a credit rating. But as I stressed earlier on, it has to meet the value for money uh, test uh, and the um, and it needs to uh, meet the, the, the tests that will be set out by the Scottish Government before we would proceed. Uh, but it is a valuable piece of work, and I'd like to thank the investor panel for their efforts and the information they've given us. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes uh, portfolio questions on finance and parliamentary business. And there will be a short uh, pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow frontbench teams to change positions, should they wish. Thank you. <laughs>